today I'm going to be sharing some colored pencil tips on drawing realistic fur. For this project, as always, the supplies I'm using are listed in the video description, but you don't have to have the exact same pencils or the same colors. It's the values that matter more than anything else in making your work re look realistic. As you can see in mine, or you will see in mine, I'm using a lot of purple. Cheetahs don't usually have a lot of purple, but it will still come out. Anyway, let's just, just move on to the artwork. I'm going to ramble forever. For this one, I am working on Arches Hot Press Watercolor Paper. This is a fairly smooth paper, but still has enough, enough tooth that the color pencil sticks to it really, really well. I started by drawing everything out with a 4H graphite pencil. When you use a graphite pencil, make sure when you're going to go over it with colored pencil like this, draw it really, really light and use a light lead. If you were to use, let's say a 5B or a 6B, the pencil lines are going to show. You're gonna have a really hard time covering that. But here, because I'm using such a light lead, you're not really going to see that through the colored pencil areas. I'm using my nightshade pencil. This is the Derwent Lightfast. If you only get a couple of colors with Derwent Lightfast, get their violet and their nightshade. Oh my gosh, they are amazing. And there is no other brand of pencil that has those two colors. That it, it's so good. And well, those two colors that are Lightfast, I should say. So I'm going through everywhere that's going to be black and I'm just loosely filling this in. A bonus with the Derwent Light Fast when I blend this out with odorless mineral spirits, they blend out really smooth, really smooth. So that's, that's a big deal. Now I'm going to start with the eye. We've got a lot of these gold and orange tones. Notice that nothing is one single color. You can see as I move back and forth, I'm adding gold tones, I'm adding oranges, peaches. There's a lot of colors in everything. So quite often people say, well, I need to know what color to paint blonde hair or to paint a tan dog. There's no one color. You're going to have a lot of colors layered to get anything if you want it to look realistic. If you try to do things in one perfect color, this is especially true with portraits. One color, you just created a cartoon. It doesn't matter how realistic your drawing is. One color equals cartoon. So I blended that out with odorless mineral spirits. While that dries, I'm taking my white Derwent drawing Chinese, my that didn't come out right. Derwent drawing Chinese white, let's do that in the right order, and I'm going to burnish, meaning I'm pushing fairly hard here, over everywhere that I want to expose little tiny white hairs. I'm going to be using a product, it's called the Slice Tool, to re-expose some of those tiny areas. That makes no sense just yet, we'll get there. But the point is, notice that I had to put the white down and I had to burnish, I had to push pretty hard to make this work. Blending that out with the odorless mineral spirits. I don't care that the purple is smudging into it. That actually works to my advantage. Now, really quick, I'm going to pause this for a second. If this video is moving too fast for you and you want to follow along where most of this is in real time, head over to Patreon for as little as $4 a month. You get access to all of my longer tutorials. There's a new one every single week and over 300 as soon as you sign up. If you want to see what lessons are available, head over to my Patreon video library. The link is in the video description and you can see everything available there along with a free two-hour colored pencil demonstration. Okay, back to this. I am back to burnishing. So again, pushing hard with my pencil, which is not something I normally recommend, but I am burnishing white over all of this. And you're gonna see later on areas where I missed, it's, it's gonna be noticeable. Right now, it's kind of hard to tell. What I'm doing is protecting the paper. When you blend with odorless mineral spirits, it pretty much dissolves that pigment into the paper. It stains it all. It's kind of the easiest way I can think to describe that. So by putting the white down first, I'm protecting the white of the paper. So when I come back through with the slice tool, which will happen in just a moment here, then I'm able to re-expose some of the white. If I did not put the white down first, the slice tool doesn't work really well when you've blended things out with odorless mineral spirits. With the slice tool, that one is really a Effective. If you've burnished and not blended with odorless mineral spirits, it's very easy to re-expose the white of the paper, sort of. But here, that is why I've gone over all of the light areas of this guy with that white pencil first. And one of the things I really have to be careful with here is protecting the white background. I want to leave that background really, really white. So any smudges whatsoever would mean I would have to fill in the background with some other color or some sort of background that, well, isn't white to fix it. So I've got glassine under my hand. This is going to keep the oils from my skin off the paper. And it's also going to keep that paper really white. 
So you have to be super careful through that. Don't, if you have like little eraser marks or colored pencil crumbles start to fall, do not wipe them away with your hand. That could smudge. Use instead a drafting brush or you'll see me use the Faber-Castell Perfection Eraser. It's got a brush on the end. That works too. So now I'm gonna go ahead and start layering some of these colors on top of that white, well, that bled, bleated, bleated, bled in with the purple. I'm going to go ahead and layer that in now. Now this intentionally is going to be too dark. You'll see why in just a minute. I know I keep leading up to just a minute. I get to show you the cool stuff, but we've got to get this layered in first. So I've blended that out. We're gonna let that dry completely. Whenever you use odorless mineral spirits, make sure you let that dry all the way before you put colored pencil on top or even with a slice tool because you could damage the, your paper really, really easily. So while that dries, I'm gonna go ahead and start adding black on top of the purple. Now, the purple, layering that in first is going to allow my black to be even darker. If I just put black where I wanted the black spots, it's going to have a more flat look to it. But by mixing that in with the purple, look how dark that black came out. It seems backwards, but it works. You're getting a lot of depth in there. Now this is the slice tool I was talking about. Look how now I can scrape away. I'm just lightly going over it. And I'll have a link to this product in the video description, but I'm lightly going over everything and re-exposing that white, the Derwent Drawing Chinese white that I first burnished. Look how I can get these tiny, tiny details. But like here, I didn't put white, nothing happens. It's not really exposing anything, the paper underneath, because the paper is too stained, too saturated from having blended with the odorless mineral spirits. That's why, like this area, you can see I had a lot of white down first, why that was so important to make sure I had white anywhere where I might want to create fur marks with this tool. Now, as I use this tool, I want to make sure I'm still creating those clumps and clusters of fur. The little strands need to overlap and group together. They're not just random lines everywhere. I want to watch my reference photo, make sure these fur marks are going in the right direction. Now, if you're new to using this tool, it will take some practice, especially if you're combining it with odorless mineral spirits like I am. The best thing you can do, see right there, there's no white underneath, nothing. You're really not seeing any difference. But the best thing you can do is put that white underneath first. If you are someone who just burnishes your whole project, meaning you're blending everything by pushing hard, you're not using odorless mineral spirits, you're gonna get different results. So you've just gotta play around with that, do some experimentation. See here, you can, you can see where I skipped and did not get the white enough. And then areas where the white comes back, it stands out so nicely. Now these lines are fairly harsh. So I can come back through later on with some white pencils and soften that, soften, soften that up quite a bit. So now we'll go ahead and speed that back up. I'm going to be adding a decent amount of these gold and orange tones in with the purple. So notice my black spots. They're purple first, then I put the black on top, but the transition between that black spot and the tan, I'm going to want it to fade in from the black to the purple into orange tones. So notice that throughout the entire piece where I'll start getting that transition. So it's not just flat black tan. Getting the little tiny details with darker colors, that's easy, that's no big deal. I wouldn't really bother, at least for me, I think it'd be a little bit of a waste of effort to use the slice tool to re-expose black underneath a color. The pencils show up just fine on top of light colors. It's really trying to get the light to show up on top of the darker colors that I find the slice tool to be more useful. But you have to you have to know you're going to do that in the first place because you've got to know to put the white down where you're going to need it. It's not something that you're going to be halfway through the piece and go, oh, that tool would be handy here, but you didn't actually work the piece in a way where that would work. You've got to layer it right to get it to come up with that look. Now, the purple tones that I'm using here, there's two. There's the, the violet is the more purple purple tone. The, the nightshade is the one that's a deeper Oh, kind of somewhere between the violet and black. It's like a blackish purple color. Both super useful pencils. And I'm doing the same thing here that I did on the face. I had already burnished with the white. I blended that out and now I'm taking these tan colors going on top, making my spots stand out a little bit more. We'll blend that together. Now in this case, this is important. Look how I'm able to smudge and blend that purple. I let it blend right over the tan. I don't care if it bleeds into the tan areas. 
when I once I put the black in, I have to start being careful. I do not want to smudge the black into the tan areas or I'm going to come up with a lot of gray. So be be aware of that as you start blending. I can be messy and smudge all I want with the purple into the tan. Once you start adding that black, slow down, blend the black areas separate from the tan areas to avoid that grayish muddy mess. Now I'm using these darker brown tones to create some more little bits of fur. And that really demonstrates what I was talking about where the brown, the darker colors show up on top of light really easily. So I wouldn't worry about making a dark base and putting light on top and exposing that with a slice tool. I don't feel that that's really super useful, but re-exposing white, now that is a useful bit of that tool. That was terrible grammar. You guys knew what I meant, hopefully. Here I'm using the white pencils. You can see they show up some, the white and the tan pencils. They do show up over the dark areas, just not quite as much as the, the slice tool re-exposing white does. See right there, that like that's pretty bold. And then I'm gonna come through with my pencils and clean that up. And I also wanna soften some of these areas. That slice tool is going to be pretty harsh. So where I want the fur to be softer, I just go right back over that area with the pencil. Same thing on this last section. Here's another important thing to point out or important tip. Break it down into smaller sections. So I worked on his face one night, then the back of, from the ear back, and then the top of the head, a separate painting session. By breaking this up, it makes it easier to tackle. And you can break that up into even smaller sections. If you try to do the whole thing at once, I'm gonna work on all the details of the spots at once. I'm gonna work on all the details of the white fur at once. It gets very, very overwhelming and the work tends to come out a bit more sloppy. So if you can break it up into smaller, more comfortable chunks to work in, that will make it much, much less kind of overwhelming where you're just thinking, I don't know what to do next. I'll just scribble something here. And you, you just feel like you have a bit more control. Now here, I'm using this. This is the Faber-Castell Perfection Eraser. That's that cream. Well, it was an eraser. I don't know if you can tell with how fast this is moving, but it had the brush on the end. If I erase a little bit of these areas that is just too dark, the white pencil is not sticking well, take that, erase it, and then go over it with a white pencil, you can get the areas really, really light again. It's not that it erases enough that it exposes the white of the paper completely again, but it does remove enough of the pigment that the white pencil will stick very well. So that is a really help. That is a must-have item for me, is the Faber-Castell Perfection Eraser. A regular eraser won't lift enough. It kind of gums up and just moves the pigment back and forth, whereas the Perfection Eraser actually lifts some. Now my next step to get more white details is going to be using the combination of Touch Up Texture Titanium White Mixture from brushandpencil.com, this stuff right here. I'm going to mix that and the titanium white powder into what is essentially a paint mixture. Now you may be thinking, why can't I just use white ink or white acrylic paint? Because those are not going to be archival on top of your wax and oil-based colored pencils. While it may look good initially, stir those together. Well, it may look good initially. It's going to wear off over time. So if you're selling your work, that matters. You don't want to sell something that things are wearing off and fading or chipping off. So this is the only product that is made that I know of that is completely archival and that I trust in my artwork. And now I can use a liner brush and paint in these little areas that weren't just weren't quite bright enough. And this product has really changed how I work in colored pencils because I used to have to spend a lot of time protecting the white of the paper. I don't now. If I go too dark, no big deal. I know I'm just going to paint this over it. And even if I didn't want it to be white, because obviously that's the only color we have here, once that dries, let's say I wanted a bright yellow bee in front of a black, the black part of his ear. That yellow is not going to show up. So I can paint this, paint it white, and then once that dries completely, I can use a very light hand and go over that with a yellow pencil so I get that bold, bright yellow. This product adds a bit of tooth back to the paper, so your pencils are going to stick really well to it.
some last details in there. And a lot of this I could do with the pencils. It doesn't have to be with the touch-up texture titanium white mixture because these are fairly, well, those ones are thin lines, but a lot of what I was just doing were thicker lines. The Chinese, joint drawing Chinese white pencil would have worked just fine for the this whole back area. But being that I had the product out, may as well go ahead and keep using that to fill in some of these lighter blotches. Notice how the fur groups, it clumps and clusters together. That is such a big deal in making it look natural. If you just put a bunch of individual strands, he's gonna look like a zombie cheetah. We, we want him to look fluffier. So you create these clumps and clusters of fur. You really wanna pay attention to your reference photo, how that fur moves, where does it change direction? All of that makes a huge difference in the end painting. So there is my finished drawing. Now my last tip on this, when you take a photograph of your work, it is really hard if you leave a white background to keep it super white. So before I do any prints, I take this into Lightroom and I fix that white background so that it's not reflecting the other colors in the room where I took the photograph. If I just take a photo, it will always reflect. In my case, I have a lot of teal in my house, so we get this weird bluish tint. It's not cute. So I use Photoshop or Lightroom to correct that background back to totally white. And again, if you are members over on Patreon, you've got the two hour and 15 minute version of this lesson if you wanna follow along with me there. My mom threatened to tell you guys about me and my love of cheetahs as a child. But I didn't think she would, so I'm gonna do it myself. So when I was a kid, I had such a huge imagination. I never really outgrew that as it turns out. But I love cheetahs. They're my absolute favorite, favorite animal. I would run around on all fours, scratching neighborhood kids, roaring at them, roaring, roaring, doesn't matter at that point. And that's all I wanted to pretend. Make believe for me was cheetah running around on all fours. And it got to the point where my parents were like, okay, she's getting a little old for this. We're getting to like third grade now. She's still running around thinking she's a cheetah. And they were afraid that the other school kids would start to pick on me because I was being a weird kid. And while that never happened, and I am grateful for my parents for looking out for me, I remember having to go and ask them like on rare occasions, I just really wanted to pretend I was a cheetah that day. Can I pretend I'm a cheetah for 10 minutes or 15 minutes? And sometimes they'd say yes. Sometimes they're like, we've got to break this habit. There is something wrong with this child. So yeah, my love of cheetahs continued on. And I I don't know why my mom thought that would embarrass me. I was weird. I'm still weird. I think it's hilarious. The neighborhood kids I kept scratching thought it was less, less hilarious though. Have you subscribed yet? If not, I have a handy button right there. It's round, has an orange arrow going towards it. If you click on that, that'll help you to keep up to date with all of my new art videos every single week. I also have an email newsletter. You can sign up for that. And don't forget to click the bell notification icon because YouTube is terrible about notifying people when new content goes live.